Namaste. 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 <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> I thought of gay Marangeli this week. What? <laughs> that was the reaction you were supposed to have, actually. <laughs> gay Marangeli being this boy that, from Italy that moved into uh, our school district when I was in sixth grade, before gay meant what it does today. He was just happy Marangeli. It's just a happy and that will, um, why I thought it was going to become apparent a little later on, but it occurred to me, I remember his birthday party where we played um, Americans and Crowds. Oh boy. And, uh, well, it was, this would have been like 1971, so you could still play World War II games, and uh, shot each other on the front lawn. Only apparently we were also playing Resurrection <clears throat> because it seemed to me that nobody I shot stayed dead for very long. <laughs> but that may be more about, you know, 11 or 12 year old boys than anything. This is uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent. It is the Sunday, this sounds like a hippie thing, doesn't it? It's the Sunday of love. <laughs> so, but I, I sort of put myself in a, in a sticky situation because in my uh, infinitely limited wisdom, I, I uh, decided that what we really ought to do on the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's is not talk about the second Sunday in Christmas, but talk about was traditionally known as Mary, the mother of God. So I'm now confronted with this Mary thing twice, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it might seem redundant. And so I really want to talk about love. And, um, but I can't really do that unless I talk about virginity. And, um, and or the lack thereof. And all of this is going to go back to gay and working. Wait. It's going to go back. Wait, trust me. We're going to go on a journey, and we'll come back. <laughs> some years ago, of course, 2009, I think it was, I scandalized some people when I used the Sunday to talk about the unvirgin Mary, like the uncola. <laughs> um, and the idea that it's long past time that we update this idea that well, the, not this idea, this huge double standard that exists in terms of how we look at sexuality for women and sexuality for men. And, and how promiscuity in a woman is just being a stud if you're a guy, right? And, and that um, the church had been the agent, and still is the agent in many corners, that reinforces that kind of notion. That, that the ideal woman somehow is somebody who couldn't possibly be your mother. Um, and and, and it, it can get more or less twisted than that. But I think really, we have to remember that you couldn't swing a dead cat in biblical times without hitting somebody who was born of a virgin. Right. They were on every corner. And so saying somebody was a virgin who gave birth meant something very different than what we assume it means today. And unfortunately, with our penchant for reading ancient texts as if they were the Milwaukee Journal, Sent Journal Sentinel, um, we lose a lot of that. What I'm more impressed with is the fact that we like to grab onto certain things like virginity and never get around to this idea that if Mary was a 15-year-old single mother, how we treat 15-year-old single mothers in our culture huh. is somehow much less than loving. Um, not somehow, it's nothing but much less than loving. And how, yes, there's a certain relativity to all that. It's not unusual to be a 15-year-old mother when you can reasonably only expect to live to be 30. I mean, you better get started start. But at the same time, we, we miss that we choose a lot of our values. A lot of our values are not innate. Now, the idea that we shouldn't kill one another is probably an innate value. Uh, there aren't too many cultures that support that idea, unless, of course, these are terrible, unless, of course, they're sacrificing virgins, which brings us to another whole problem with that notion. And yet, 
we don't get 2,000 years later to a place, really, where we've learned what love is. Because if we learned what love is, we couldn't dispose of one another, metaphorically or actually. We think that love is something that we feel when what we really are is attracted to someone. And maybe a little more than attracted, at least attracted enough that we're getting some return. So we know there's a possibility that something might go farther. And we reduce love, then, to what you can do for me. We might say we confuse love and minions. I have a coffee cup at home that says, so much to do, so few minions to do it for me. <laughs> that, that we reduce love to <clears throat> this contractual kind of thing that only occurs in romantic settings and which says, I will love you as long as you continue to do what it is that makes me feel good. And I, that goes way beyond sexuality, but for some people it does. And, and love then becomes what I get, and in return I'll agree to tolerate. It was interesting that a story, a uh, study was released um, recently that talked about what really keeps couples together is paying attention, now this is my paraphrase, paying attention to each other's stupid little stuff. Well look, there's a bird out the window. And if you're my partner, you should go, yes, there is. Even if inside you're thinking, oh, fuck, you're exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because what I really am saying is, would you affirm that my interests have some value. And as long as you're willing to do that, and, you know, can fake it if what you're really thinking is, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, another bird. That's only the 500th bird he's pointed out today. I need to get him to the hospital. That's <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, look, that one's just like, oh, look at that. <laughs> we, it, the article talked about it in terms of a bid. As, as a bid, not as a, you know, not yeah. an auction, but a bid for attention, attention yeah. affirmation, yeah. verification. And the thing is, it takes so little effort, you know, to just go, oh yeah, that is the 400th round this week. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the same yeah. one. It's the same one, yeah, because it lives in the birdhouse, it's in the backyard. It's not that, you know. <laughs> but that's love. And it has nothing to do with, you know, all this other stuff. Scott Peck, M. Scott Peck says, love is caring about the spiritual growth of the other. Which is another way of saying I want what's best for you. It doesn't mean I drag you to some spiritual service kicking and screaming, come on, we're going to the 52nd retreat, weekend retreat this year. <laughs> right? wow. No, it says I really want what's best for you, and I'm going to give you the space to get it. Contrast that. With Gaylard, that is the man's name, Gaylard Williams. Gaylard Williams is a pastor at Praise Cathedral of God. Can you say Jesus? Hey! In Seymour, Indiana. I, I, I think I spent a year in Seymour one day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or right near there. Uh, Gaylard is, ironically, an anti-gay preacher. Now, when our kids played soccer, they always had to check that they had the right gear on. So you would, the, before the game, the two teams would line up and the, uh, what do they call them, referees in soccer? He would go down and the kids had to like pound on their shins to prove they had shin guards on. And they had to show the bottoms of their feet to prove that they had, didn't have metal, metal cleats on. Which is why that's a game for sissies. And then, <laughs> if you can't tear each other up, how can it be a sport? <laughs> and then they had to pound themselves in the groin to prove that they were wearing protective gear. Well, it seems old Gaylard was in the park checking other men for protective gear when he got arrested. Is this the same dude you went to school with? No, no, this is not, no, he was, I'm sure his name was Gaylord. I don't know, he was Italian. Who knows, it's probably like Giovanni and they called him gay or something. No, this is somebody else. Okay. But Gaylard made me think of gay marangeli, which... Got it. 
So, Gaylard was looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> but, by and large, well, there's two things we need to learn. The first is that show me a law preacher who preaches anti whatever. I don't care if it's drinking, I don't care if it's drugging, I don't care if it's carousing with women. I don't care if it's carousing with people of the same gender. I don't care if it's playing dominoes for money. They will fall doing exactly what it is they preach against every last time. Probably because they don't love themselves. And probably because they don't love themselves because somebody took advantage of them when they were younger in precisely the way they are now acting out. Will the praise cathedral of God, amen again, love Gaylard? No, they will kick his cup to the curb just as fast as they can because they don't want to see him get whole. They want to know what he can do for them. And checking for protective equipment is not on their particular list. <laughs> Sheriff David Clark, yeah. one of my favorite people, said this week that protesters crossed the line when they walked onto I-43. Maybe he meant the line where the little red and green light is. That's you know, they must have washed up the ramp. I'm sure he didn't mean that they crossed the line because they made his officers respond to them. I'm sure he didn't mean that they somehow were working against the best interest of the community. I'm sure the same sheriff that said that everybody ought to be behind their door with a gun because the police couldn't help them wasn't the least bit concerned that one of those people up on that ramp maybe had a gun. He can't see beyond his self-interest. If there is an original sin, it's that we can't see beyond our self-interest. Now, at some point, that served us really well. When we were wearing skins and you know running from cave to cave uh, and had to spend most of our time worrying if we could scramble together enough to eat and take a look at whether what was coming towards the cave opening looked familiar or unfamiliar, like us or not, those things kept us alive and perpetuated the species. But then hopefully as a culture you take the, you, you evolve to the next that level. And the next level for us is love. And what seems to be lacking is a fair amount of, of, of empathy and a fair amount of insight. It's a tragic thing that two police officers were killed in New York City. It is no less tragic than the other people and given the way our justice system has elected to respond to that, we shouldn't be surprised that two police officers were killed. Now, that there was those two, and that it was in New York City. That, 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 that we can be surprised. <clears throat> but you can only diminish people for so long. You can only fail to love for so long. You can only act contrary to love for so long before, before they push back. And you cannot control how they're going to push back. I mean, it's just impossible. But I can tell you that if I believe I'm unloved and if I believe I have nothing to live for, I don't have any rules anymore. Even those innate rules go. Even that thing that says it's wrong to kill. Because if I think I'm going to be the next one, well, Why not? Yeah. And, and it really does all come down to love. Because we don't look at each other and say, how could I help this person take a step towards whatever it was, or whoever it was, that they were sent here to be? How do I help them take a step toward achieving their full potential? And the things that we tend to do to others 
like silence them, put them in a corner, get ahead of their expense. None of those things quite obviously do that. And what we don't see is they don't do it for us either. Because to the extent that I step on you, I step on myself. That's the whole Buddhist notion of interconnectedness. That's the whole notion of, you know, no justice, no peace. That's, that's the whole idea that we either go forward together or we go backward together. But I don't think as living beings we can stay in the same place. Living things that stagnate and die. And, and so we're faced with a choice. It can be all about me. And then we're going to see these things continue to happen. Or it can be about all of us together and trying to help each other get to the place we're meant to be, even smallest, most incremental steps towards wholeness. And it takes that faith, and I don't mean a faith in God, I mean a faith in everything that Mary had. That faith that says, well, this is a fine mess I've gotten myself into. <laughs> How am I going to explain this to the parents? But still says, you know what? It's going to be okay. It can be okay. I'm going to stay present with it and trust that it will turn out in the best way it possibly can. Doesn't mean there's not setbacks. It doesn't mean it's always a whole bunch of giggles. It doesn't mean that we always feel warm and fuzzy. But there's a movement. And love always moves us. And if it doesn't, then we know it isn't love. Then we know it's something else, and most often when it comes to what we think of as love, it's control and manipulation, which usually comes through isolation. So if we want to look at this part of the story with fresh eyes, maybe rather than look at it as Mary's story, we can look at it as all of our story. Maybe all of us get a message somehow that calls us to a place we'd rather not be. And we can either try and run away from it, which in my experience just delays the inevitable, or we can move toward it. Which doesn't mean we always feel great about it. Doesn't mean we're always happy about it. Doesn't mean it's always comfortable, but since when is growth comfortable? Love leads us forward all the time. And that's really all we need to know. <laughs>